challenges of artificial super intelligence. Uh, let me see. Um, yeah, so this is my present academic home. So this is Finneman University, which is the first university that never founded when it took over the history from France. So um, this is the East Asia, the country. There's not a lot of money in this in science in the Philippines, but um, there, um, there are lots of smart things to talk to, and both in ecology and also some computer science. And uh, that's actually an overlap people doing uh you know fish image recognition. And yeah, so the topic of today is essentially how far will artificial intelligence go based on how much energy you need. And the so you know the, the audience, which I uh, assume the, the online audience and uh, everybody here, yeah, I probably don't have to convince that. Uh, artificial intelligence has made great progress in the last uh, decades. So, you know, there, these are some examples, of course, uh, be defeating human champions in Go and chess, you know, uh, image recognition generation, text production, and then things like um, autonomous vehicle navigation. So, all of these things are, are very impressive, and you know. Uh, I don't. I don't want to be like a, a naysayer, right? Like I, I will argue that there is a certain limit, but that doesn't mean that I'm not not absolutely impressed by uh, these um, by these achievements. So you know what we can probably agree on is that all of these achievements are more or less single skill. Uh, tasks, right? So the program which plays Go doesn't need to play chess, and the autonomous vehicle navigation system does not uh, play chess or Go. And so this is a different difference to humans. So there's also a philosophical discussion. You know, what do these achievements mean? You know, how similar is this to human cognition? And and I think this is an interesting discussion, but it's it's tricky. But I think we can agree that it's a a single task uh, achievement, whereas the, the, um, the ultimate goal, in a sense, is will there ever be artificial general intelligence? So, who are these guys? So, I actually took one of these artificial intelligence free online uh, image generation programs and I asked them, uh, you know, please make a painting of artificial general intelligence. And then you, you you can choose you know, which style, and I choose you know like a Renaissance painting. So they look really uh, you know I don't want to make fun of you know image generation. I think that's a really cool stuff, but I do think it is funny. Uh, the artificial general intelligence seems to have eye problems. But so this is uh, essentially this is a apex achievement, right? This would be uh, to having an entity. Uh, running in a computer which is as good uh, as a human uh, as all of these things, you know, go driving a car, seeking, drawing, right? Uh, not in separate programs, but in, 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 in one unified. And um, so the question is, will we get to this? And then let's say we have artificial general intelligence, and let's say it's running on 10,000 uh, supercomputer nodes. Why not just double, triple the numbers, right? And it would be the equivalent to, you know, doubling or tripling human brain power, right? And then we would have something uh, called artificial super intelligence. This is the same software. The super intelligence does a lot more intelligence than the artificial general intelligence. So that would be then an, an entity which is way above what a human. And so this would be uh, the artificial super intelligence. Intelligence would relate to us like we relate to a chimpanzee, right? I mean, there are, of course, many similarities to human and the chimpanzee brain, but you know, the human brain is three times large and so much more powerful, right? Like a human, I mean, a chimpanzee can use a stick, right, to poke for terminals, and that's tool use. 
but you know, humans can make you know, black dogs, cars, spaceships, everything, right? So it's it's a massive difference. And then you know, the, there's a lot of speculation. And uh, our argument in this paper, which I uh, published with my friend and colleague Jake Hogan, who was up until very recently with the Blue Brain Project. Um, we argue that we are not going to, and we are not going to get there for the following reason, that uh, essentially the number of computational steps per time which a artificial general intelligence, intelligence will have to carry out will have to be similar, at least in an order of magnitude, to what a human brain is doing. And this, from this, we can then compute how many, we can calculate how much energy this artificial general intelligence would uh, need to even run. And so what do I need, uh, so what do I mean by computational steps? So this is a, in neuroscience, this is almost cliche, this in computer. Yeah. So this is from my postdoctoral advisor from 15 years ago, and um, on, from Patricia Churchland and Terry Zanowski. And it shows the different levels of organization in a brain, particularly in a human brain. So we can start at the at the top, right? We have the CNS, the central nervous system, which is essentially, you know, the, the whole brain and you know how it interacts with the environment and how it performs. And then we would have systems. So for instance, there would be the motor system, which allows them to grab something, the visual system, the auditory system. So so these different components of the brain which uh, they're not isolated from each other, but in a certain way, they're separate enough that you can study them. There would be people who would study their, their uh, visual system their whole career, right? And of course, they would be interested in the auditory system, but there, there would be brain regions which clearly only process uh, sight, right? uh, which process the signals coming from the retina. And the same thing with the auditory system and then you know, you would also have things like this uh, emotional limbic systems or these homeostatic systems to, you know, maintain the body temperature. So, you know, this, uh, there's also a spatial scale here. This would be on the level of tens of centimeters. Then you would have these maps. So uh, a lot of these, these, particularly in the visual system, there is a very direct mapping of, you know, the, uh, positions of stimuli in the real world versus how they excite the retina versus how they end up, so the visual systems here, right? Uh, how they end up on, on very systematic maps in the human brain, right? So then we're talking about networks and these are of course networks of nerve cells, of neurons. So this would be something in the order of magnitude of uh, you know, millions of neurons and uh, millimeters of distance. And, you know, these networks would have uh, very precise arrangements of wiring, which neuron connects to which neuron, and there would be different types, right? There would be excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, probably multiple types, particularly of the inhibitory neurons. So, so this would be very... Uh, you know, we're getting to the cellular level. And then we're getting to the level of neurons by themselves. So the individual cells. And then um, these are, so basically they're often, they're underappreciated, right? When you, when you have uh, simulations of ner nervous systems, you would sometimes have this highly simplified neurons, which are essentially a dot and a line which connects the dot to another neuron, and then other um, there would be an incoming signal, and there would be some kind of a sigmoid transfer function from the input to the output, and that that would be the neuron. But in, in reality, it is uh, so basically where you, know, you can see the neuron over here. Uh, these neurons would have all these protrusions 
10, the contained drives when they're receiving inputs, exons when they're sending them out. And there are the all kinds of ion channels on these 10 drives, which make them more or less excitable. So basically there's a lot of very specific computation going on in subsets of neurons. And this is true both in insects as well as in mammals that sometimes you would have these neurons which would be many hundred, up to a millimeter probably in length. And so this part of the neuron might be computing something really different from this part. And then there's, there's some, some kind of averaging or there's some kind of median table uh, in, the, in the soma, in the cell body, where the neuron then sends the signal back out. So then, see, we, 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 are, we are still not at the end of this ladder. So uh, we have a, a lot of synapses. So we, you know, what's a synapse? It's a connection between neurons. And each synapse is not simply a switch where if the neuron is active, it, it sends a, like a single bit to the next neuron. But then, you know, there, there, are, there are many, many components here. How, you know, does the synapse habituate? So if it's constantly active, does the, does the signal get strong, get weaker, or maybe it gets stronger, or maybe the, you know, there's a resonance that it first gets strong and then weaker. So again, a single synapse, which we're dealing with, uh, you know, a little bit like several hundred nanometers, this is our point. You know, this is a computational device, single synapse. And then still, when we go smaller, when we go to individual receptor molecules, so ion channel molecules, these are you know, computational units. So a, uh, for instance, there's this um, MMDA glutamate receptor, which is integrating the, the uh, level of excitation of the cell in which it's a part of, uh, and it's integrating that in a non-linear fashion with the signal which is coming from the uh, cell, which is sending it a signal from the, the presynaptic cell. So why, why am I giving you a such a um, you know mini tour of the levels of neuroscience? Because every single one of these levels uh, performs computation. So if you if you so the, the estimate for the uh, nerve cells in a human brain is about a hundred billion. So and it's wrong to say we have a hundred billion uh, computational units. We and you know they would they would perform let's say ten computations a second based on their spiking patterns, right? On the on the signals which they're firing. Rather, each neuron in itself is a it's a huge computational machine, right? With many uh, synapses and with many receptor ion channels. So basically, there is a a massive amount of computation going on at all of these levels. And uh, so, you know, to come back to a proposal, we think it we, to generate artificial general in intelligence, this guy, uh, that <laughs> you don't necessarily have to do it in the way in which the human brain does it, but you probably have to uh, perform a comparable number of computational steps. I, I will get back to this assumption in the end. Now, how much energy would that use? And and there are there's a way to estimate that, which we we took. And this is the way. Uh, yeah. So basically, you know, this is, this is another example. Right? This is the simplified synapse in in many artificial neural network models. Right? There's a pre-synaptic activation. There's a signal transfer function, and there's an output. Whereas in brain, synapse, right? These are the with the chem with the neurotransmitter chemicals which excite the postsynaptic neuron. You know, there is there is the information transmission from DNA to RNA to protein, right? Which which happens at the slower times, but it also happens in in all of these uh, cells. And then you know you have this, this complex biochemical cascades in the cells which do computations. So, you know, this is just another making the point again that there is an enormous amount of computation going on. So, how much energy would that take? So, some people actually tried to simulate uh, at a high level of detail 
uh, how that would work. And this is you know, this is this blue brain project, which uh, you probably heard about that. There was, you know, I, th I think it's it's good to have ambitious goals, but maybe they probably oversold it a little bit, right? And, you know, people were upset that all this happened. So I think I think they got a half a billion euro as a funding, and then of course you have to make great great promises and. That didn't happen, of course. So my, my friend, Jay, a co-author, was working with them for the longest time. And he was, you know, he, he was um, not, a, not necessarily a company man. Right? <laughs> like he would he would work there, but he would still think about, like, what are we even doing? And this is how this paper also came about. And um, now, the, um, so they had a massive supercomputer, and they simulated this. Right, so they simulated uh, about 10 million neurons, and each neuron was represented in great detail. So they went from essentially the network's level to the neuron and the, uh, the synapse level. They, never, they didn't really uh, simulate this mechanism. So that basically the, uh, the conformation changes of the individual ion channel molecules uh, of you know these receptor transmembrane proteins. So they did not simulate that very similar. Uh, they just didn't have enough capacity to simulate these larger levels. So uh, 10 million neurons is um 0.01 percent of the neurons of the human brain, right? And then uh, the, so how much energy did that take? And so basically the blue brain, I know it's, it's not very didactic to have, you know, a slice with a little text. It's just unavoidable, unavoidable. So the computer had uh, two times uh, 10, 2000 uh, teraflops with uh, 400 terabytes of memory. And uh, so the 700, 20 processors use 400 kilobytes for, you know, as I said before, 10 million units. And so um, the whole thing used uh, 270 kilobytes. So then it took eight hours to simulate one second of biological time, right? So that means, uh, so eight times, 60 times, 3,600 times eight. So, you know, many thousand times, uh, you know, uh, 300,000 times slower, right? And so not only did that use this enormous amount of, you know, room filling hardware with a lot of electricity, but it, it still, it, it was not nearly as fast, you know, it was not computing this on the fly. And so basically, if we then would take a blue brain approach, which really isn't even stimulating the smallest computations, right? We would to, to uh, simulate the whole mouse brain, we would take 2.7 megawatts and 2.7 gigawatts uh, to simulate the human brain. And the human brain uses 20 watts. Which is actually a useful quantity to uh, remember. If you, for instance, if you're in charge of like a lecture room like this, because you can, if it's full of people, you can turn down the heating by like 20 watts, multiplied by the number of people. Uh, like a, it's the, the brain is a, by far the most energy intensive organ, of course, in a human. So, you know, and then, so, you know, this. This is still only the slow simulation. So if we then use this conversion factor to make it 300,000 times faster, and we can assume we probably need about 300,000 more energy, meaning that and when you compare that to 20 watts, uh, the, the, the biological brain is about nine times uh, nine, 900 million times faster, right? And then a, a, a conventional computing architecture. 
So in order to simulate all of these complications, which are actually going on in the um, human brain with current, you know, silicon uh, you know, chip, semiconductor, conventional, I mean, a computing architecture, we are in an incredibly large amounts less efficient. And we, we can then, so, you know, and then we're still not, um, you know, we, we're still ignoring the smallest level. And then I, I think that there's one more level we have to And so if we want to be a super intelligence, right? I mean, you're, you're not, as a scientist, you're not, sometimes you're sitting alone in a room, but you need to interact, right? Like it's the most depressing thing for a scientist that just have no idea to talk. And, and you know, this is, a, this is the best example for the, uh, the you know, particle physics is kind of notorious, right? For having like hundreds of orbits. So this is some CERN study, right? Of this particle accelerator. This is only, this is only from A to M. So the rest didn't even fit on the screen. For that. So then, you know, in order to have an entity which surpasses humanity uh, in the cognitive ability, you, you cannot just simulate one brain, right? You probably have to simulate the power of a couple of million, right? It's hard to put a, put a number on this, right? How many, how many people do you have to put in a room to, to, Gather the whole of human knowledge. Well, I mean, you know, you guys are really good at computer science, and you know, there's some knowledge in biology, but I mean, there's probably no knowledge in agriculture, or, you know, like in a lot of other things. So, how many people do you have to send to really get all of human knowledge together? So, we made an estimate of just 8 million, and that might be conservative. So, so then, you know, we, we get to these equations. So Special requirements of artificial superintelligence or EGAS equation. It sounds a little bit like a Hungarian organization. <laughs> yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> so, so this equation I think makes a lot of sense. And, and I think it's it's really kind of like the Drake equation. Are you familiar with this? So this is the equation is how likely is it to find other intelligent civilizations in the universe, right? And then you might like the number of stars, the fraction of stars with planets, where how often did a life start, might be how often did might descend on a life start, how often did intelligence uh, organisms evolve, how often did the intelligent organism start you know, using radio communication, right? And then you get a number, right? And then the, the Drake equation is true, right? And what's what's up for discussion is what numbers do you put in the Drake equation? Right? And obviously, we have like, most people would agree that we haven't seen any space aliens, right? Visit us. So, so why is that, right? There will be one number which is really small in of, in the Drake equation, and people can argue about which is it very unlikely that intelligent life arises or microcellular life. It's very interesting, and I think this is very similar, right? So, the energy requirement for artificial superintelligence is essentially the energy requirement of the brain. And F, which is the, uh, how much less efficient are uh, computers. And so here we had, what, uh, 900 million, right? And then we have a G, which is the group size for, you know, group intelligence. So we, we took 8 million, but it actually, it does not, the argument does not depend on that very much. And, uh, you know, F is, is the superior. So, you know, like it's, a uh, if you have um, somebody who, like 1.1 might not be very good, right? If, if you just have a super intelligence, which is just 10% better, which is just like, you know, some chess champion, right? <laughs> and whereas, you know, we, you want to have something which is like significantly higher. So we, we choose three. So then we get to the, uh, we get a value for our assumptions, which is about 7.8 times 10 to the 20 second uh, power watt. How much is that? So we, we made a little plot, of course. So this is the, this is obviously a logarithmic plot. 
So, you know, here we have the human brain that's 20 watt. And then, you know, we have the mouse cortex. This is the, uh, this is what the human brain project is. Right? So, mouse cortex section simulation. Then if we would scale that, right? So if we, if we would make it that we uh, would, we would have the whole mouse brain immediately the energy requirement would go up. Then we have the largest supercomputer. So if somebody really wanted to, they could probably almost simulate a whole mouse brain where you simulate one hour, uh, one second in eight hours. Right? And then you have the, uh, the human brain scaled. And then we, here we have the mouse brain scaled and time corrected. So here we are at the point that we simulate one second of mouse brain activity um, in, in one second of computer time. Right? And then we have the US power output. So this is the whole electricity the largest industrial nation in the world produces. And then, you know, we have the human brain simulation, just the thinking human brain, right? Um, uh, scaled and time corrected, meaning that we simulate the whole brain and one second of simulation time is one second of human brain time. And that is already three orders of magnitudes more than um, we get from the whole U.S. power grid. So I don't think, you know, I don't think it's, it's going to look very much very, I think if you have like group intelligence, if you have 8 million humans, we're, we're right up there, right? So we're obviously, we are we're six orders of magnitude worse. So we're like 11 orders of magnitude worse than what uh, the U.S. could power if everybody else, you know, stops using electricity. And so, so you know, uh, these three are sad because they're not going to come into existence. And um, so I think, I, I think the building is owned by the Catholic Church, right? So, so I think if, if, you, if you promote somebody to stay into it, you actually have a advocatus diaboli, right? <laughs> like a, like a devil's advocate, right? <laughs> Correct, and I, I think that's how it works. And then, then all the other cardinals are away, you know, it should be the same. And then that person has to take like the counter position. So I'm, I'm going to try to count the Manon argument here. And there are three possible workarounds. So you know, what about fifty thousand lines of cable, right? So there are some cheap that you need to have all these processing steps, which not in shape and form, but in, in, in number, roughly, or the magnitude, correspond to the human brain. What if that's not true? So basically, what if some brilliant computer scientist can just you know, sit down, write 20, whatever, 40,000 lines of enormously brilliant code? Obviously, you know, that, that would have to be trained, right, with data sets. And then, and then all of that, you know, biological nonsense can be uh, circumvented. Could that be possible? And so basically that argument to paraphrase that would say the human brain is terribly inefficient. All of these processing steps, you know, the, the fine tunes uh, electric activity in the brain, in the dendrites, right? All that, you know, the, the all, the, all of these receptors, right? These uh, neurotransmitter receptors, they're, they're multiple, multiple different uh, subtypes, right? All of that is essentially just, um, it's a waste of time. And in reality, we, we, we don't need that. Now, why do I not believe that? So this is Metaspirinia Valkoti, which is from the early Cambrian, which is one of the first, um, Coordinates. So it's it's a it's just a step before the first vertebrates. So this is like a proto fish, and they're actually very similar animals still alive. And then they have something which already resembles at least the gross anatomy, you know, the rough divisions of our brain. 
So there's a, like a hind brain, a mid brain, a fore brain. And so, you know, this is half a billion year, years ago. And then there are billions of vertebrates on the planet. And each animal, each generation is an optimization. So this, you know, essentially, this is a genetic algorithm with a billion steps with many billions of individuals. And uh, I think we have really achieved a level of optimization of animal brains, which to me doesn't make it very credible that essentially the human brain is just really inefficient and everything it does, we could essentially, you know, just, there would just have to be a really, really clever call. So I don't think that works. Now, you know, we can, why don't we copy uh, and still compute in ways like the brain calls? And that people try that, right? It's called neural model engineering. Now, um, I have, I spent three years in a lab where half of my colleagues were doing this and they're still my friends and we respectfully disagreed, but we disagreed. So I was not impressed, essentially. What they did is they, they would take principles from neuroscience and then they would, they would write algorithms, which are essentially running on conventional computers for the most part. And, you know, they would try to essentially, um, you know, run some clever kind of algorithm based on, let's say, dendrites and exons. And uh, there, you know, it's, there was, there were interesting approaches, but this is not essentially, they were not trying to replace, you know, uh, semiconductor chip computing at all. That's, that's, I didn't get the impression. The other, other thing is quantum computing. I, I tried to read into that a little bit when uh, reading this paper. I can't say that I, I have a high level of expertise. It could be that uh, this will uh, get uh, significantly closer to that uh, final goal. So, um, in, in conclusion, I don't think that energy, uh, better because of energy requirements, we would ever get close to artificial general intelligence or as a next step to artificial super intelligence. And I think a lot of the, the discussion has been very uh, you know, utopian, very science fiction like. So that there are these warnings, you know, that these systems will essentially take over human uh, methods within months or years. I, I don't think this would, this is uh, in principle likely to happen. So my thanks go to uh, my co-author Jay Hogan and to Dan Brooks, who was actually, I think now he's in Bielefeld. He, he is an uh, American scientist who was at the Conrad Lawrence for a while. That's where I met him. And this is a paper which is, is related to this field. Um, I would like to uh, take three more slides of your time to uh, tell you about something completely different, and I hope this is interesting too. So I'm trying to, so, so there is a very uh, flourishing new field in the last 10 years probably, which is called um, psychedelic medicine. So there are the substances, you know, which for the longest time, you know, they had essentially they had a, a bad PR, right? And MDMA, you know, ecstasy, but there are increasingly very professional efforts by the medical community to use these in psychiatry. So for instance, for people who have, you know, a post-traumatic stress disorder or, you know, other chronic uh, psychi psychiatric problems. And I think this is a good field, but I think they're often, it's a, a scrapshot. And so they're they are often there applying these very complex substances and they're not really understanding what's going on. So the, um, there is some work of uh, how to simulate and how to theoretically understand the effects of psychedelics on whole brain activity. And some of it is mine. So uh, some of the work and I'm trying to commercialize this basically. So, I'm trying to get funding or to get a startup going to uh, run simulations of how do human brains and you know brains with problems react to these psychedelics, and 
you know, what exact, what concrete tips can we give these medical practitioners? Which substances should be combined? How should that be handled with sleep, right? It's, it's a sleep is a very hot topic, I think, in this uh, context. So if you're interested in teaming up, if you have good leads on, you know, who would fund me, fund us, you know, if you have any inputs, I'm, I'm very happy to do that too. So thank you.